Coming up on the Q30 newscast, students were notified of attempted catalytic converter thefts on the North Haven campus. What university officials are doing in response? How the university is celebrating Black History Month and encouraging students to learn more about the contributions African Americans have in our community. Plus, tomorrow is National Pizza Day. How this fan favorite food is represented in the New Haven community. All that and much more coming up on the Q30 Newscast. It's Wednesday night at 9.30, so it's time for another show, uh, another show of newscasts. I'm Nick Antoniatis. And I'm Clever Streich. I'm excited to be back on the desk with you, Nick, to discuss this week's top stories. We start tonight with some breaking news at the Hamden Collaborative Learning Center, where a handgun was found in a classroom Tuesday morning. Police were originally called to the school for a physical dispute, which led to the arrest of an 18-year-old student. Police were called back a few hours later when school security got information that there was a handgun inside the school. It was found in a closet of a classroom. The gun was said to be put there by the student who was arrested earlier in the day. This student was found shortly after and arrested again. He is being held on bond. No one was injured in the incident and there was no threat to the students or staff at the school. Unknown suspects have attempted to steal the catalytic converters from student cars on the North Haven campus over the last two days. Public safety is working closely on the matter. Q30's Vanessa Blasey has more on the story. Just last night, Quinnipiac Public Safety told us that there were two attempts to steal catalytic converters on North Haven campus in the last two days. These attempts were separate incidents, yet Chief of Public Safety Tony Reyes says the getaway car was likely the same both times based on matching descriptions. In further investigation, we determined it was it's also a vehicle that's suspected of actually carrying out these thefts in other towns such as West Haven. At around 2.30 p.m. on Monday, public safety responded to suspicious activity in the lot where they found an unsuccessful catalytic converter theft attempt. On Tuesday at the same time, an officer saw someone try to steal another, but they fleed the scene in a 2004 Honda Civic. Here on North Haven, many students are worried to park in the lot. This has happened a couple of times now and it's a little worrisome. I mean, I wouldn't want to get in my car and realize I can't come home, so. Yeah, I mean, this is like North Haven. It's, not, it's a pretty safe area. Um, I'm kind of don't want to bring my car now. I want to just take an Uber. Now, police know that catalytic converter thefts have been on the rise since last year. Chief Ray says that taking them from any of these cars can be done in just seconds. So the bang for the buck is there. It's very easy to steal and it's relatively pretty profitable because, you know, they can get quite a bit of money for it. For now, Rays recommends students be more aware of their surroundings and call public safety if they're worried. Just be aware if you see somebody kind of acting suspiciously in between a car, just kind of be aware that that's not normal behavior and that it's okay to call us for us to go check it out. Reporting from North Haven parking lot for Q30 News, I'm Vanessa Blasi. Moving to some news on the Mount Carmel campus where construction is underway for the new South Quad. Q30 caught up with Sal Filardi, the Vice President for Facilities and Capital Planning, to get an update. According to Filardi, they have started digging the foundation and excavating for the new residence hall. It is still on track to open in the fall of 2024. They are hoping to start construction on the new School of Business and the academic building soon. They are still waiting on final state approval. After hearing student complaints about the changes on campus due to this construction, Filardi says that he believes it will be worth it when the project is complete. When, uh, when these three buildings open, it's going to be awesome, and, uh, and I think everybody is going to really appreciate it then. But in order to get there, there's going to be some inconvenience for the next couple of years. The School of Law will be hosting multiple events to help raise awareness about human trafficking called the Human Trafficking Prevention Project. These events will be taking place February 7th to February 10th and, the Feb and on February 16th. The first event will be discussing sexual assault and the ca and on campus and Title IX. The second event will discuss children crossing borders, migrant children's vulnerability to children. These events will be taking place on North Haven campus. It's Black History Month and on-campus organizations are hosting events to share anti-racist education and culture. The Student Programming Board and the Black Student Union are hoping to engage the community throughout February. Q30's Samantha Pirelli has more. 
Since Black History Month has begun, organizations on campus like the Black Student Union and the Student Programming Board are trying to spread awareness on why Black history should be important every month. Deja Banner, the president of the Black Student Union, says that their organization is for students to feel like they matter at Quinnipiac. So being Black History Month, what I would want people to learn from me and also what I'm learning from people is like pretty much so to like embracing my culture. Like I understand like it's kind of hard being like this is like a predominantly white institute. You're trying to find like your people like you don't know where to go to, but this is why we have all these different multicultural orgs on campus. SPB hosted an event with a cappella group, Ball in the House, which teaches students educational anti-racist concepts through songs created by African-American artists. Christina Steffler, the Cultures and Conversation Chair for SPB, said that she hopes people take away Ball in the House's purpose. My whole position is about uplifting other marginalized communities. Um, so that's something that, you know, Ball in the House is definitely exemplifying. The a cappella performance encouraged students to use their voices for positive change around campus. Using our voices to actively encourage, again, peace, harmony, empathy, all those things, right? And it's not all doom and gloom, right? Like, every now and then, just take a step back and to appreciate all this the black joy and excellence that came from these musicians and their, and their music. For Q30 News, I'm Samantha Pirelli. More on Black History Month. This past Monday, Raymond Two Hawks Watson, the founder, of CEO, the founder and CEO of the Providence Culture Equity Initiative, came to Quinnipiac to speak to students. He spoke about the ways his culture identity is, has shaped his journey and the importance of culture in society. Watson described his story to students hoping to open their minds about the value in recognizing culture. Earlier today, the Quinnipiac Department of Cultural and Global Engagement hosted a conversation about classism in America. The event discussed the ideologies of classism through inclusive conversations as part of the annual MLK Dream Week. The conversation also highlighted the work of Martin Luther King and his fight for class before his assassination. Bringing back another community conversation, on Tuesday night, the university hosted another Talks on the Rocks. This semester of, on this semester's event was based around diversity and inclusion. Up to 50 students were allowed to sign up to eat free dinner and talk with each other and administrat administrators about the given topics. Student Government Association Vice President for Inclusion. Jamie Seltzer organized this event. Let's take a look. I think doing something about diversity and inclusion where we can really gauge where people are, gauge what people need, uh, is, is really important. I hope that students who come to this will be able to feel like their voices were heard and be able to feel like they're actively engaging and making the university an even better place. The York Hill Tech Center announced the opening of the client services. This operation would include helping students with cue card services and technology services. The Tech Center will be located next to the mailroom at the Rocky Top Center. These services will be open 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Mondays through Thursdays and 12 p.m. Through, through 5 p.m. on Fridays. Have you ever wanted to take the ice at M&T Bank Arena? Well, now you can. Quinnipiac Intramurals announced a series of open skate and open puck nights on Mondays throughout February. Grab a friend for an open skate from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. and bring your stick for pickup hockey from 7.15 p.m. to 8.45 p.m. Visit the Quinnipiac IM Leagues website for signups and more information. It's almost time for a commercial break, but first, let's take a look at the upcoming forecast for the next several days on campus. Join us now with the three-day weather preview is Q30's Connor Core. Connor, what should we expect coming up? Yeah, thanks, Nick and Clever. You know, as you look at to the get, get a little tease for this upcoming weekend, you're going to see a lot of mixed weather heading up over as we head into Friday. Today it was obviously very sunny. It'll be the same way on Friday, but Thursday you can expect a lot of clouds and rain. But you know, you talked about the open skates at the MET Bank Arena, so I wouldn't advise with this type of weather that to be ice skating at the pond over at CCE. But after this commercial break, I'll be back with the full forecast. I know what you're thinking. I need a job. I need a new career. Well, I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. I wasn't happy with what I was doing. After high school, I didn't have a plan. I just wanted to start working. I got laid off twice. But you got to keep going. You just need the right skills. Find an apprenticeship. I found a two-year IT program. I found a medical course online. I'm now a consultant in the tech space. You have more options than you think. You can do this. You will find something. You will find something new.
If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. I think it's just vapor with flavor. It won't hurt my kid like cigarettes, right? Vaping is safer than smoking, isn't it? There's really not even that much nicotine in them, right? My kid? My kid, my kid knows it's dangerous. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping, maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. Welcome back to Newscast. This week is National School Counseling Week. It recognizes the role school counselors play in the lives of students across the country. Q30's Andrew Reynolds has more. At Quinnipiac University, there are so many resources that students have access to, one of those being student counseling services. In a National School Counseling Week, we want to highlight the service here at Quinnipiac. We're here to help students with any challenges that might prevent them from succeeding academically. So we help with anxiety, depression, but anything we can do to help students sort of make the adjustment to college. I would say it definitely helps having the support of the school counselors. They were so sweet and they wanted to do anything to help the students. Christine hopes that this week helps bring attention to services on campus that students may not even know exist. I think that the National Counseling Week brings awareness of, of what we do and that we are here and we can provide those services. Um, anything we can do to promote the fact that kids have services available to them and students can access that care for themselves. Both Jen and Christine want to invite more students to come by to use the services for those who may need them, especially for those who may be worried to start. Anything that you tell them is confidential. I feel like one of my worries when um, I was first seeing like the counselors and everything was that they were going to tell my parents or they were going to kind of like disclose the information. Um, but all of it is super confidential and overall they're just there to help. It's a welcoming environment. We don't share your information with anybody. You really are just taking care of what you need to take care of in as um, brief and expedient way as possible um, without anybody else even having to know that you do this. The brand new student counseling wing, which is right behind me, is located on the second floor of the rec center. Andrew Reynolds, Q30 News. Thank you, Andrew. Now, Clever, I'm curious to know any national news that has happened this past week. Yeah, me too. To tell us more about what is going on, we have Q30's Jackie Udrovo. Jackie, what do you have for us? Thank you, Nick and Clever. A lot has happened across the country this week. On Tuesday, it was announced that eight more officers with the Memphis Police Department will likely face charges in the death of Tyree Nichols last month. On January 7th, 29-year-old Nichols was pulled over by police for a traffic stop. In the body camera footage, it shows Nichols fleeing the area on foot before the officers caught him and beat him at a nearby intersection. During Tuesday's council meeting, it was announced that 13 officers have been implicated on at least administrative charges. The eight officers identified have not been publicly named as they are set to receive statements of charges as the investigation is still ongoing. Spotted in the sky on Saturday was a Chinese spy balloon that was shot down over South Carolina. The balloon was first seen in U.S. airspace on January 28th when it flew over four military sites in Wyoming, Montana, Nebraska, and Missouri. A day later, the U.S. Navy recovered the balloon in the Atlantic Ocean. According to the Pentagon, the balloon was up to 200 feet tall. This was not the first time a balloon similar to this has entered U.S. airspace. The same thing happened at least three times during the Trump administration. The Chinese government claims that the balloon was just a weather balloon that veered off course, saying that the U.S. response was unacceptable and an overreaction. A week after announcing the closure of 87 locations, Bed Bath & Beyond has announced that it will close 150 more stores. Over the past year, the company has closed 400, which is about half of the 950 stores it had opened in February of 2022. The announcement of more store closures also includes the closure of 49 remaining Harmon Face Value stores and the five Bye Bye Baby locations. In the past few weeks, the company has announced that it may not be able to remain in business and that they may file for bankruptcy if they cannot raise the money to stay in business. That's all I have for national news today. I'm Jackie Drovo, back to you at the desk. Thank you, Jackie, for this week's look at news from around the nation. It's time for another break, but when we return, we'll have another weather update from Connor Core And a look at political news with Katie Cohen. There's more to come on the newscast. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just going to drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh, man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not OK to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on, man, let's put a ride home. Hmm. 
maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made home ownership happen. Homeschooling yourself on loans, beefing up your credit score. So I'm pre-approved. You were like, yes! Sorry. Color coding listings, ticking boxes, and flushing every toilet in a 20-mile radius. Home sweet home. You aced house hunter. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. I don't think that many kids in my son's school even do it. He makes fun of his friend who vapes. He would never try it. She's in the song. She's on the honor roll. She's just on the table. No way. No way. No way. No way. My kid would never vape. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping. Maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. Thanks for staying with us on the Q30 newscast. Clever, we heard about the forecast early tonight, but I'm wondering what should we expect from the week ahead? Yeah, so am I. To showcase the full forecast, as well as live temperatures from around Connecticut, we welcome back Connor War. Yeah, thanks guys. You know, when I mentioned in the tease that it wouldn't be best advised to, you know, try to skate over at the pond at CC, it's really going to be that same way for the rest of the week as we look at these temperatures and precipitations coming in throughout the next couple days. You know, Thursday, it's going to be raining for most of the day with a high of 45 as we head into the Friday. It's going to be a high of 53 and fluctuating between 32 um, with partly cloudy. It'll be the same way on Saturday, just a little bit colder with a high of 43 and a low of 27. But as we look to Sunday and that big game, Super Bowl Sunday, which Keith will pre preview later in the newscast, it's going to be a high of 42. It won't necessarily affect everyone in Glendale, Arizona. It's going to be a little bit warmer there. But back here, it's going to be a high of 42 with a low of 32, like I said, fluctuating between the, that temperature right there. As we start off the week on Monday, it's going to be raining for most of the day, uh, 48 with a low of 32. Again, once again, once again fluctuating. Uh, and on Tuesday, it's going to be partly cloudy with a little bit warmer, high of 51 and a temperature low of 37. Now as we look at to the rest of the state of Connecticut with the temperatures, you know, you got Torrington, Danbury, and Norwich at 36 with Hartford and New London at just a tick above at 37. And as we look down to the south, uh, we got New Haven at 38 degrees. You know, you'll hear a bit later as well about what significance New Haven might have to a special holiday that may be coming up over the next few days. So as you look at the state of Connecticut, these are the temperatures around our area. And we'll send it back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Connor. The State of the Union was last night, and the Quinnipiac University Democrats and college Republicans each held watch parties for their organizations. The Quinnipiac Democrats held their watch party in the School of Business. Attendees took part in bingo and listened to President Joe Biden's address to the nation. And the college Republicans met in CCE for the watch party. During the State of the Union, they called out topics that they did not agree with, holding discussions while enjoying pizza from their local favorite, Falcon Pizza. Since we're on the topic, let's explore this week's biggest political stories. Q30's Katie Cohen joins us to talk about the last night's State of the Union. Katie, what do you have for us? Thanks, Clever and Nick. With President Joe Biden delivering his State of the Union address last night, there is a lot going on in the world of politics. During his speech in Washington, D.C., the president spoke before a divided Congress for the first time since the GOP took control of the House. It was one of the rowdiest State of the Union addresses in recent history, with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy actually shushing members of his own party at least four times. In his speech, the president laid out some of his administration's accomplishments as he reflects on the first half of his term. These included last year's $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. He also urged Congress to help him finish the job on a number of key priorities, starting with the economy. But he was met with controversy when he suggested some Republicans have proposed cutting Medicare and Social Security. Some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. <laughs> Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now, right? With the parents of tyrannicals in the audience, the president called on lawmakers to pass police reform. And on the topic of foreign policy, the president reiterated his support for Ukraine and took aim at China just days after a suspected Chinese spy balloon was shot down. Former Trump press secretary and newly installed Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders delivered the Republican response. She rallied against what she called a left-wing culture war and said Republicans would hold the Biden administration accountable. There were some suggestions that President Biden used in his address last night as a soft launch for his re-election bid, 
Vice President Kamala Harris says if this happens, she'll be running with him yet again. That's all I have for politics today. I'm Katie Cohen. Back to you at the desk. Thank you for the political news, Katie. It's time to take another commercial break. break for one, but when we return, we dive into with a look of Super Bowl 57. And Dylan Summer will fill us in on the latest in Quinnipiac athletics. Stick with us on the Q30 newscast. scan a simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early i'm here to save you but i feel fine that's great but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer oh man that's a new fence if you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at SaveByTheScan.org. Type 2 diabetes can have a big impact on your life, but how can it be prevented? Well, the first step is knowing if you have prediabetes, a serious medical condition that puts you at high risk for type 2 diabetes. One in three American adults has prediabetes, but more than 80% don't know they have it. The good news is, prediabetes can be reversed. And for many people, healthy changes in their daily routine can make a big difference. Take the one-minute risk test today at doihaveprediabetes.org. Welcome back to the Q30 newscast. Nick, do you have any plans for the big game? I do. I'm going to be going to your Super Bowl party. Hey. <laughs> Campus is a buzz about Sunday's matchup between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs. For a preview of the showdown in Scottsdale, here's Q30's Keith Savage. Thanks, Nick and Clever. Super Bowl Sunday is this Sunday in Glendale, Arizona at 6.30 p.m. As the Philadelphia Eagles face off against the Kansas City Chiefs. This is Casey's third appearance in the last four years, and they look to gain their first Super Bowl win since 2020, when the team defeated the San Francisco 49ers 31-20. Patrick Mahomes won MVP of that game and will look to gain his second. Andy Reid is the head coach of the Chiefs, but he also coached the Eagles from 1999 to 2012. Philadelphia is now led by head coach Nick Sirianni, making his first appearance on the big stage. Eagles center Jason Kelsey and Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey, the first brothers to ever play against each other in the Super Bowl. Both of them are looking to gain their second rank. This year's halftime show will be performed by Rihanna. That's all I have here. Back to you guys on the desk. Thanks, Keith. Now, Clever, I'm not done talking about sports right now. Hey, as producers at Q30 Sports Pause, we're never done talking about sports. Here to talk about this week in Quinnipiac Athletics is Q30's Dylan Summer. Dylan, what do you have for us? Thanks, Nick and Clever. It's been another eventful week of Quinnipiac Athletics. Let's start off with men's basketball, who just completed a three-game homestand. The biggest game of that stretch was a nationally televised game versus the Fairfield Stags last Friday night at a packed M&T Bank Arena. The Bobcats came out victorious, winning by a final score of 66-51. to Graduate forward Ike Noeke had a terrific performance with 18 points and 8 rebounds. After going 2-1 in the home stretch, the Bobcats find themselves sitting in 4th place in the MAC. They will be back in action against Niagara on Friday. On the other side of the court, the women's basketball team has had immense success since the return of star graduate Mackenzie DeWeese as they won against the Ryder Bronx and the Marist Red Foxes in convincing fashion, both 17-point-plus margins. In both of those victories, centers Michaela Morris and Mary Baskerville shined on the court. Morris had 16 points and 6 rebounds against Ryder and 12 points and 6 rebounds against Marist. Now the women's basketball team will look to continue their momentum into this week as they face the Canisius Golden Griffins tomorrow at 11 in the morning. Quinnipiac beat them last time out, 69-53. to Finally, let's take a look back at the men's ice hockey action from the past week. Bobcats traveled to Cambridge, Massachusetts on Friday to face off against the number eight ranked Harvard Crimson. Goaltender Yanni Peretz saved all 25 shots that came his way to shut out the Crimson. Next, the Bobcats continue along with their road trip against the Dartmouth Big Green. Dartmouth got off to an early one goal lead in the first period, but it seemed that the Bobcats could not configure their offense at that time. 
However, it was an offensive onslaught in the third period that pushed the Bobcats all the way to a 4-2 victory over the Big Green. Now the men's ice hockey's team next test will be against the Clarkson Golden Knights. And that's all for sports. I'll send it back to you guys at the desk. Thank you, Div Dylan. Hey, Clever, you know that tomorrow is National Pizza Day? Well, I did, and I'm glad that we have some right here to celebrate. If you're wondering where you should get a slice tomorrow, look no further than New Haven's iconic pizza parlors. Q30's Olivia Cattell has more. New Haven pizza is typically synonymous with restaurants like Sally's or Frank Pepe's, but there are many spots that contribute to the city's reputation for pizza, including Zanelli Pizzeria. Named after three brothers with years of pizza making experience, Zanelli's was established three years ago when they moved to Connecticut's pizza capital. Our history begins in 1991 when we moved from Albania to Italy where we grew up for 22 years and I learned there how to make the dough and the work in the restaurant industry. My other brother learned how to make the cheese. Two brothers, they make both the cheese. And my other brother is a customer service. We always wanted to do something together. Zanelli prides themselves on their traditional approach to pizza making, ensuring every step of the process meets traditional Neapolitan standards. If you never tried the Neapolitan style, please, you don't have to go to Napoli. Come and watch the street and you have an amazing experience here, just like in Napoli. Located on Worcester Street, Zanelli's is no stranger to critical acclaim, having received both statewide and nationwide attention for their pizza. So when we came here, basically, we took our risk and our changes. So we didn't study very well the street, uh, how famous it was for the pizza. We just liked the spot and said, why not? Let's make it. You know, we kind of Alba Albanian a little bit on the hard head, and we took the risk. But we knew that we're going to bring something different here, and... Uh, People love it. For a state that is considering making pizza their official food, Zanelli's is a prime example of the quality and importance of the New Haven pizza scene. For Q30 News, I'm Olivia Cattell. Earlier today, the Q30 News Twitter account posted a poll asking students what their favorite pizza toppings are in honor of National Pizza Day coming tomorrow. We wanted to know which toppings students prefer, cheese, pepperoni, pineapple, or veggie. It's now time to reveal the results of that poll. 42.6% of you said that cheese is the elite pizza topping, with pepperoni coming in at a close second, and veggie in last. Thank you to everyone who participated in this week's poll. Now, Clever, I chose pepperoni because personally, I'm not, I think that pe cheese is just plain boring, and I'm not a big fan of veggies, so I would personally say pepperoni was my favorite. I have to agree with you. I'm all the way with the pepperoni. Team pepperoni, honestly. Yeah. And I may have a little bit of a basil going on right here with this pesto pizza, but I am a big fan of pepperoni. And to be honest, I really like Zanelli's. Honestly, this is my first time trying out Zanelli's. My favorite has always been Sally's Pizza across this area, so I have to say Zanelli's is not too bad. Hey, Frank Pepe's for me. And uh, what are some of your other favorite pizza spots over in Hamden? I, I'm a big fan of Falcon myself. Personally, I like to go in New Haven and try out Sally's Pizza, which is my personal favorite. Modern Pizza is a sleeper. And Frank Pepe's, I know it's always super busy, but I always like to go there because, you know, it's a classic. All of them are just phenomenal in my opinion. Hey, we encourage you to try out all different types of pizza tomorrow, any sort of toppings as you enjoy National Pizza Day. We're all out of time for today's Q30 newscast. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to all the producers and everyone from behind the scenes to make this show possible. Please visit our website at q30tv.com and follow our Twitter at Q30 News. For Nick and Tony Otis, I'm Clever Streich. Good night from Hamden.